Friends, it is my privilege today to speak on the Psalm 135. Essentially, this text is a hymn of praise, and therein it contrasts the greatness of God with the worthlessness of idols. Pagans, or by any other definition, non-Christians follow and pursue idols, but God's people worship the true and living God. Let us divide our text up today into three points. Number one, praise. Number two, provision. And number three, the believer's return on investment. Let us look, please, at our first point being praise, focusing on the verses one to three. In these first three verses, the Bible uses the word praise five times. And when you hear repetition in God's word, we better listen intently. Look, please, the verse one. Praise the Lord. Lift up your voice privately and publicly. Praise the Lord with your words, talents, abilities, time and skills. Give honour and glory to the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Give the name of the God of the Bible majesty. Jehovah, Redeemer, Provider, Conqueror, Master, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Give his name respect and show it royalty. Do not use it sparingly and lightly. God forbid, do not use it in vain or to swear or even claim it for some scheme to further your kingdom rather than his kingdom. We must become less. He must become more. Praise the new servants of the Lord. Give the master our best efforts as we seek to serve and advance his kingdom and not our own. Look, please, at the verse 2. You who minister in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise God for those diligent priests who served in the temple centuries ago and in the surrounding area, in that place in David's capital, who laboured day and night to honour and obey the Jewish ceremonial law for those God's chosen people. Now, at the house of Jacob, that would be the vehicle from which the promised Messiah eventually came. Praise God today, no more priests required to offer sacrifices for you and I. Praise God for the only priest, the high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, who prayed for you and prayed for me as he sacrificed his sinless life on that cruel cross of Calvary. That same Jesus Christ who intercedes for you and I even this very day at the Father's right hand. But Lord, while no more priests are required, you allow faithful ministers who pastor and preach and teach to faithful followers. We pray as praise God for them today. And for those denominations that take a strong stand on biblical values. Allow me to say people can be mocked. Institutions, churches and ministers can be mocked. But God will not be mocked. Look then at the verse 3. Praise the Lord for he is good. God is good isn't he? Through all the ups and downs and happy times and sad times, God is good. He is from everlasting to everlasting and he is good. His love endures forever. Sing praise to his name for that is pleasant. Do you know the longtime leader of the Billy Graham Crusades was a man by the name of Cliff Barrows who went to be with the Lord in 2016 and Cliff once remarked in an interview this is what he said. Music reaches a man's soul quicker than the spoken word. Cliff also said in another interview, the Christian faith is a singing faith. And a good way to express it and share it with others is in community singing. You know, the great reformer Martin Luther once said, next to the word of God, music deserves the highest praise. Make a pleasant noise unto the Lord. And whether, like me, you are absolutely tongue deaf, regardless, the Lord knows the heart of a joyful singer. Friends, we've thought of our first point being praise. Let us move on to our second point being provision. Number two being provision. We're going to focus on the verses 4 to 11. Look, please, at the verse 4. For the Lord has chosen Jacob to be his own. The psalm writer in the text today is speaking to the very descendants of Jacob, and that they were a chosen people that reflected God's commission to the nation. 
This is what Moses had said years earlier to the same people. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 to 8. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of this earth to be his people, his treasured possession. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Friends, God chose the nation of Israel to be a protected and special people. They were to be a blessed people from which the Messiah would emerge. And through the temple sacrifices, the people could be redeemed with priests acting as intermediaries toward the living God. They were the first people to meet with the Savior born in Bethlehem. They were the first people to come into a living and personal relationship with Jesus through his teaching and ministry. And even thereafter, his crucifixion, death, resurrection and ascension. During the time after, the early church first converted Jews, even before the Gentiles. As we look again at the verse 4, it says that Israel to be a treasured possession. Allow me to say today, I strongly believe in the political and moral existence in the modern state of Israel. I believe that after millennia of anti-Semitic persecution, and particularly after the events of the Second World War, that Jews deserve a nation of their own and to ensure their national protection. But perhaps this verse has frequently been taken out of context and no excuse can be made for some actions of that country. But their intention is not to be the only democracy in the Middle East. Their fulfilling mission, being Israel, was, as Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And now that the living Saviour has offered salvation to Jew and Gentile alike, we can read verse 4 again and know that we, as a covenant people, where the promises of God has now passed the believers in the church, are chosen to be his own. Friend, wherever you are in the world today, allow me to say this. You are a treasured possession. God treasures you and gives love and mercy to all who, who believe in him. The verse 5. I know that the Lord is great. And here the psalm writer acknowledges God. He is great. And then the psalmist lists out from the verses 6 to 11 and 12 all the things that they could see in their day. Remember, this was a people who operated and lived in predominantly an agricultural society. Let us go through these verses quickly. In the verse 6, He does whatever pleases him in the heavens and on earth and in the depths of the sea. The verse 7, He makes clouds rise, sends lightning and brings out the wind. Verse 8, he struck down the firstborn of Egypt and firstborn of people and animals. Verse 9, he sent signs and wonders into Egypt against Pharaoh. And verse 10, he struck down many nations, killed mighty kings. Friends, allow me to say that the bottom line is the Lord does whatever pleases him. We would be wise to have a healthy fear and respect for God. The grass men in Ulster, the silent contractor, contractors, would be wise to have respect for the Lord's day and turn off the keys for their harvesters and reapers. By the times have changed, haven't they? The United Kingdom, being a nation that once feared God and built an empire upon which the sun never set, is today more interested in debating 40 different imaginary genders. 
Boris and Rishi and other leaders like them would be wise to acknowledge Almighty God. Do you know, the recently deceased Queen's father, King George II, on his victory in Europe day radio broadcast to the nation at 9 p.m. on the 8th of May, 1945, began with these words. Imagine hearing something like this today. Today, we give thanks to Almighty God for a great deliverance. The king went on to talk about the war, and this is what he finished his broadcast with. In the hour of danger, we humbly committed our cause into the hand of God. He has been our strength and shield. Let us thank him for his mercies, and in this hour of victory, commit ourselves and our new task to the guidance of that same strong hand. The king started with God, ended with God, and thereby honoured God. If you ever get talking to me personally, you will eventually realise that outside of the Bible, two of my own public heroes have been Sir Winston Churchill and Reverend Dr. Billy Graham. A number of years ago, you can understand my delight when I was scrolling online, that I found out that they had actually briefly met. Allow me to share the story with you today. During Churchill's tenure, second tenure as Prime Minister in the 1950s, the Billy Graham Crusade came to London and Churchill invited Graham to meet with him. When Graham arrived, the secretary reminded him that the Prime Minister had only 20 minutes. When Billy walked in, Churchill motioned with an unlit cigar for him to sit down. And then Churchill congratulated Graham on the huge crowds the crusade had been drawing. I dare say that if I brought Marilyn and Monroe over here and she and I together went to Wembley, we couldn't fill it. What is it that fills Wembley Stadium night after night? I think it's the gospel of Christ, Graham replied. I'll tell you, Churchill said, I see no hope for the world. I am a man without hope. Do you have any real hope? Are you without hope for your own soul's salvation, Graham asked. Frankly, I think about that a great deal, Churchill replied. And telling the story later, Graham said, I had my New Testament with me. Knowing that we had but a few minutes left, I immediately explained the way of salvation. I watched carefully for signs of irritation or offence, but he seemed receptive, if not enthusiastic. I also talked about God's plan for the future, including the visible return of Jesus Christ. His eyes seemed to light up at the prospect. And when the Duke of Windsor arrived for lunch, Churchill growled, let him wait, and told Graham to keep going. Graham went on another 15 minutes and then prayed for the great difficulties Churchill faced every day. He also affirmed that God was the only hope for the world and for us individually. Churchill thanked Billy, and as they shook hands, he asked that the conversation be kept quiet. And so Graham didn't tell the story until Churchill had passed away. Today I have great affection for Winston Churchill, and hearing about this conversation has made me hope that maybe, just maybe, he did in the end come to a true and personal faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe Churchill's heart was open to a greater hope once he saw that the famous message of never, never, never give up didn't save the world. Only Christ could. Remember, Mr. Churchill, or Mr. Johnston, or Mr. Sunak, Mr. Trump, or Mr. Biden. Nations that honour God. God will honour them. You'll be delighted to know it on my last point, that being the believer's return on investment. We're going to focus, as we conclude this sermon series, on the verses 12 to 21. We now think about the return for the believer. And in the verse 12, the people are given an asset. They're given land as an inheritance. In the verse 12, he gave the people the land of Canaan to his people Israel as an inheritance. Do you know, they're not making any more of it. 
They're not making any more land. Land prices have only ever went one way and that's up. But remember, this wasn't the land of beautiful country drumlins. This was land even greater in value. This was the land that the Bible describes was a land flowing with milk and honey. They're given land. And then in the verse 13, the people are given another asset. This time they're given a brand name. I want you to think of some of the biggest brands in the world. You can look at them on the screen. You can see Vodafone and FedEx and Chase, and Accenture and Microsoft and Apple and Google. But the people in the verse 13 are given the name of the Lord, for they're his people. They're given their own brand name. Verse 13, your name, Lord, endures forever. You're an eye, Lord, through all the generations. The Lord will provide more than a pay packet, more than a pension, more than an insecure job, more than a bad boss. Look again at the brand slide. Very few of these logos existed 100 years ago. Very few will still exist in 100 years through bankruptcy and mergers and acquisitions and all the rest of it. But I know one brand, one name that will endure for all generations, that being the name of the Lord. And then in verse 14, for the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. Vindication means to clear someone, to prove them right, to prove them that beautiful word justified. You, dear Christian friend, will be proven right before him someday. And the Bible also says he will have compassion on his servants, on those that serve in the church place, in the home place, in the workplace. God has concern for your suffering. But whilst we thought of these assets of land and brand and the Lord's concern for his people, let us contrast this with the treasures of earth and the treasures that man often pursued. The verses 15 to 18 read this. The idols of the nations are silver and gold made by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, nor is there breath in their mouths. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. Empty wretches, you can't take it with you. But not only can you not take the assets of this world with you, but you who make them or trust in them will be eternally empty. Look at the verse. Eternally separated from God, eternally empty, without seeing, hearing or breathing. No return on investment. A life invested in the things of this world will yield nothing in eternity. No future. A bleak and empty existence. But then, the psalmist returns to our first point. We've thought of praise. We've thought of provision. We've thought of the believer's return on investment. And now, finally, friends, we finish our thoughts today on our first point being praise. He returns to man's chief end, to know God and enjoy him forever. Whilst the first three verses of this psalm refer to praise five times, now the last three verses of the text refer to praise six times. And what are we to do when the Bible uses repetition? We're to read, we're to listen, and we're to act. All you Israelites praise the Lord. House of Aaron and house of Levi, praise the Lord. The psalmist is exclaiming, enough of the pursuit of riches in this world. Pursue the Lord. Verse 20, do you fear him this morning? Praise him. Do you know him today? If you don't know him today, come to know him. Come to know the real joy, giving personal life, walking with and following the Lord Jesus Christ. Finally, verse 21. 
Praise be to the Lord from Zion, to him who dwells in Jerusalem, to you listening to this video right now, to him who dwells in every believer's heart this morning and today. Praise the Lord. Thank you, friend, for listening. And God bless.